encouragement that I want to give you. I believe the Lord gave it to me, and I want to pass it on to you. And that's uh, this idea of not, don't let your faith go stale. If you have been in a place in your life where you just like where God can do anything and God can move mountains and and I wonder what God's going to do in my life and He's a healer and He's a restorer, w would you not leave that? Don't don't go into some kind of a complacent place where you just it becomes a routine. That's not at all God's plan for your life. That's the enemy's plan for your life, but that's not God's plan for your life. So tonight, to tonight. This afternoon, we're looking into Revelation chapter 22, which is an easy chapter to find because it's the very last chapter of the Bible. If you can't find Revelation 22, uh, then your Bible's broken. Uh, Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5, I'm calling this teaching, No More Curse. Now, uh, today we're going to see something along the lines of a reverse of the curse. And what curse am I speaking of? Why well, I'm speaking of the curse that happened in the book of Genesis. Thank you, Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, sorrow and pain is promised for the woman in childbirth, as well as contentions between the sexes. Has anybody experienced that? I, I, I don't know what that's all about. Anyway, uh, also the necessity of hard work. And the often futility of work, thorn and thistles, sweat of the brow. And after all that, death. That's the curse of sin. Well, there's a brand new reality coming. And in this brand new reality of coming, it is heaven and it is heavenly. And today we get a sneak peek into that. So please follow along as I read now. Revelation 22 verses 1 through 5. John writes, and he, speaking of the angel... The angel showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, that's the New Jerusalem, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no more night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, these are exciting verses. These are verses that spur our faith on, and Holy Spirit, for us to get any grasp of this new coming reality, it's going to take you to touch our hearts and touch our minds and to bring the understanding not only of what we are seeing here, but also, Lord God, the understanding of how these things are to affect our daily living. So, Lord, bring on the truth of your word. Our hearts are a ready soil for the implanting of your word. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. What, what a, just a blessing for the Lord to reveal these things to us. Just to say, here, I, I've got something I want to show you. <laughs> I want to show you your future. <laughs> Who needs a crystal ball when you have the word of God? <laughs> Amen. And it's not that God has hidden this stuff. It, it's all out in the open. The things that God has done and the things that God wants us to understand. He doesn't hide anything, you know. He puts it all out here. This whole book is an explanation of the revealing of who Jesus Christ is. So I hope that you have a clearer vision and thought and understanding of who Jesus is as we go through this book. So 
there also are those times when the Holy Spirit comes along and and taps you on the shoulder and and then brings you to the word and then opens it up in a special kind of way have you had that experience before perhaps verses that you've gone over and over time and time again and then all of a sudden you read it and it's like hey wait a minute look what this says this is for me and it's real and it's right now I, I kind of picture it in this manner and uh, I, I came across this thought this past Friday at my my home where we have the Bible study and I pictured as though you remember Jesus said I will bring to remembrance the things that you've heard the things that I've taught you from the word so Jesus is going to bring these things to remembrance so I thought to myself uh, for those of us who have a lot of scriptures flying around in their minds and hearts it's like the word of God is flying around all these airplanes of the word of God and it's like the Holy Spirit is the is the controller you know the uh, what do you call it the uh, the traffic controller the Holy Spirit's the traffic controller and as we continue to keep our hearts tuned into the Lord the Holy Spirit's like okay he's ready to receive this word finally come in for a landing you know and here comes the Word of God and it comes in it lands on your heart and you go oh my gosh you know this is real this is true you know and and I've been having that experience through the book of Revelation so I hope you have too uh, God is a revealer of himself that that's his intention he, he desires to reveal himself uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 uh, we're told that uh, anybody who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him <laughs> so God's just like come on <laughs> come on I want to show you something you know and, and we need to go after it that way so as we look at this verses compared to God's intention and you could look at these five verses and you could say this is something of God's original intention for humanity so compared to God's intention for us to continually live with him in close communion to live in a paradise uh, and not to die what we are experiencing right now in the here and now is a far cry from that isn't that from the reality that God will bring it once again confirms to me both the love of God and the absolute devastating effects of pride and of sin in humanity the love of God is confirmed because he has made a way for the curse to be cursed for our sin to be carried away by Jesus and for it to be forever gone. That's just a beautiful thought. I don't think that there's a believer who could not allow that thought in every single day, sometimes moment by moment. There is no longer any record of your sin. I mean, that's just like, how many times can you hear that? And it just be so glorious that God would do that for us and he's gonna bring us this new heaven and this new earth and our verses today give to us not a full explanation but it gives us a big window big window and the Lord slides open the window and says here peek into eternity let me show you what I see from 1st John chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 we learn the following to us the greatest demonstration of God's love for us has been his sending his only son into the world to give us life through him we see real love not in the fact that we loved him but that he loved us and sent his son to make personal atonement for our sins so let's do this now. Let's take a walk in the Word of God, shall we? Uh, as I already pointed out, John right now has an angel uh, as an escort. So uh, 
I'd just like to see what that's like, you know, he's walking around with the angel. I don't know, is it feathers and all? I don't know, but uh, he's walking along with an angel and the an angel is pointing out things like a docent. <laughs> we have a docent with us today. And, uh, so this angel is a docent as far as heaven is concerned and showing John around the new Jerusalem, which we talked about last week, that comes down out of heaven. It's our forever home is what the new Jerusalem is. It's beautifully adorned. As a matter of fact, it's so shockingly beautiful that I think John used the only words that could come to his mind. He goes, it's like a bride, <laughs> you know, on that wedding day, just, just beautiful and perfect and everything where it ought to be. And uh, it shines with the glory of God. And I wanted to talk for a moment just about the glory of God. Here's, uh, after I had finished this, studying on the last two chapters I uh, had this thought and the thought that I had was you notice how everything that John explains in heaven it's crystal clear it's bright it shines it reflects it radiates he uses words like that uh, he just runs out of words but then we find out that the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and its chief characteristic is that it has the glory of God. And the reason that it has the glory of God, because God himself, his throne is in the new Jerusalem. And it is radiating light because there's no sun. It's God who radiates the light itself. So the only way that anything else is seen is on account of the light of the glory of God. Just bear with me for a moment. The way that you can tell that there's a new Jerusalem, the way that you can tell that there's 12 layers of emeralds and stones and precious stones on the bottom is because it's reflecting this light. So everything that is seen in heaven is seen because it is reflecting the glory of God. Are you with me on that? One of the chief ways that we bring glory to God is to reflect his light to other people. Now, if you're like me, sometimes I'm not a very good reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I get upset, my temper goes off. I go, oh boy, this is not like Jesus. But when you're walking in the spirit, you're connected in fellowship with God, then all of a sudden what ends up being reflected off of you is the glorious light that God has allowed to shine on you. And that glory of God looks like him. So that everything that is seen in heaven looks like the glory of God because the glory of God is radiating upon it. And that's supposed to be you. And that's supposed to be me. Well, what does that look like practically? Well, practically, it looks like somebody who forgives. It looks like somebody who loves. It looks like somebody who has grace. It looks like somebody who lives off of the wisdom from the Word of God. It looks like somebody who's not bogged down with the cares and the worries, the concerns, or the grappling after the things of this world. That's a reflection of the glory of Jesus, which heaven is all about. So everything we're going to look at right now is only seen because it is reflecting the glory of God, just like we are to be. So first thing that he comes along and sees is there in verse one, it says, he showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, I know that nobody has seen and nobody has experienced water like this kind of water before. This is a purity by heavenly standards. This is a pure river of water by God's standards. And by God's standards, this water that has not yet been experienced, because it's in this new reality, is as clear as crystal. 
Water is needed for life, isn't it? So how wonderful that we're seeing water, this kind of water, in heaven. Now, I have a freshwater aquarium. Anybody have one of those or has had one of those? <laughs> a fresh, I have a freshwater aquarium. It's a big one. And uh, I really enjoy it. And uh, do you know what would happen if I would take my freshwater aquarium and if I were to add straight tap water to it? Anybody tell me what would happen? Die. My fish would die. <laughs> and the plants in there would die. Kind of makes you think twice about the water you're drinking out of the tap, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I had never thought about that before. Uh, but I killed off a couple of fish. And that's how I did it when I was first learning. And I thought to myself, hey, I drink that. <laughs> <laughs> and it just killed my fish. So uh, we get a lot of bottled water nowadays. Uh, the idea of fresh water is the idea of pure water painting this picture of refreshment and satisfaction and of real peace. Isn't that kind of the idea if you think of a river? In Psalm 46, verses 5 and 6, uh, we read these verses which really could almost fit perfectly right into where we're studying today in Revelation 22. Psalm 46, verse 4 and 5 says, There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the New Jerusalem, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Eternity. God shall help her just in the break of dawn. Bible commentator Seiss writes the following. One of the gladdest things on earth is water. There is nothing in all the world so precious to the eye and the imagination of the inhabitants of the dry, burning, thirsty East as plentiful supply of bright, pure, and living water. To me, this whole picture that we're being given here of this river and where it comes from, it's telling us that in heaven, fulfilling satisfaction will flow. A steady river of life lacking nothing. Now, it has to be this way because look where the river comes from. Verse 1 continues. Where does it come from? It proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, the first thing that I notice here is what it does not say. It does not say that this river comes from the throne of God and also from the throne of the Lamb. Notice it reads, from the throne of God and of the Lamb. What does this tell us? It's pointing directly to the deity of Jesus Christ, of his absolute oneness with the Father and, of course, the Holy Spirit. And remember Jesus said to the woman at the well, John 4.10, if you knew the gift of God, he was speaking of himself, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, speaking of himself, and he would have given you living water. <laughs> I, I dare to think that it's almost as though Jesus was looking at the woman of the well, and he was seeing her drinking water from the river that flows from his throne in the new heaven and the new earth. Can you kind of see that? He's so way ahead of us, isn't he? <laughs> and each time we open our Bibles and hear from Jesus, his living words wash over our hearts like crystal clear water. So now we may have formed some kind of mental image of this river uh, and the purity of this river and its source. And so now let's go on from that. Verse 2 tells us this. 
So remember last week, uh, the New Jerusalem comes down. It has a street running down the middle. The street is made out of asphalt, and the asphalt in heaven is made out of gold. And the gold is so clear that you could see through it. And I found out yesterday, uh, last week, from Pastor Mike, uh, I guess it's from your work that you learned this, that there's a way of heating up super pure gold. And as it uh, evaporates, right, <laughs> it, it could go right onto glass and it can be seen through. That it could become that clear. So this river, this uh, river runs through the middle of the street. <laughs> so we get that kind of a picture of this, of this scene. So here we have verse 2 says, In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month which is interesting wording because in eternity it doesn't seem like there would be time but it seems as though in eternity there is some kind of a marking of events that could be what's being said see here's the kicker it's so hard for us to be in this fallen reality <laughs> and try to get an idea of what eternity is like but that this is the picture that we're being given here and then the last part of verse 2 says, The leaves of the tree, of the tree of life, were for the healing of the nations. So let's kind of take this apart. Because you could say uh, that the Bible begins with the tree of life, right? Anybody seen the tree of life in the Bible before? Good. <laughs> we see it because it's there. It's in chapter 3 of uh, Genesis. Uh, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there was these two trees, you know, it gave them a choice, just like we're given a choice because God wants us to freely come to him and to freely choose to serve him. So we have a choice, don't we? Live by the flesh or to live by the spirit. And that's the same kind of choice they were given. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil, uh, uh, the tree of life. So apparently they were barred from eating from the tree of life after they had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because if they would have then been allowed to eat from the tree of life, their life would have gone on and on and on in a fallen state. And God did not want that for them just like he doesn't want that for us. So we don't again see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil who's thankful for that never want to see that tree uh, but this tree uh, this very special tree and it's changing fruit is readily available to us and everybody has you know red and red and you know everybody has their own idea of this they say well it's 12 trees and they say, well, no, it's one tree. Well, they say it's a tree with roots that produce other trees. And uh, that the fruits, all 12 fruits are there. No, it's one fruit at a time. So everybody has their idea about how this is. So when we get there, we'll actually have to see how it, how it actually plays out. But I want you for a moment to imagine this in your sanctified imagination. And you have to call on your sanctified imagination. <laughs> Because we have imaginations that are a mess. You already know, and I've told you a number of times, that when I sit with the Word of God, I put myself in the picture, right? So whatever's happening, I'm there watching it with whoever else is there, uh, which is a fun thing for me to do. And God speaks to me that way, and I get insights, and I encourage you to do the same. So I was trying to picture this a street with a river going down the middle and tree and the, so I was like trying to picture it in my mind what this would look like and it's in the new Jerusalem and the throne of God is at one end and and then this river flows through it and I was like ah, where, where have I seen anything like this and I thought of uh, the uh, you know the canals in Venice <laughs> right I don't know if it just John does not mention uh, gondolas so I don't know uh, but uh, the other thing that I thought of, and forgive me, I'm going to go ahead and give you this picture because I thought of a slip and slide just right down the middle, <laughs> which would be fun too. But anyway, uh, uh, imagine for a moment 
a God created tree and it is grown in the ground of the glory of God and it is watered by the river of life and the photo the synthesis that takes place is by the light of the glory of God. Pretty spectacular tree, don't you think? <laughs> and it would have to be incredible fruit, right? Like never before tasted. You know how sometimes you, uh, you grab a piece of fruit and, and it looks good and you're just about to take a bite of it. And, and just before you take that bite, if you're like me, sometimes you have that thought. I hope that this is a good piece of fruit, right? Watermelon. <laughs> or a good piece of water valve that it doesn't have any brown spots in it or rotten spots and you know lord i hope it doesn't have a worm in here you know uh okay when we're there every bite is going to be absolutely perfect and you know the story the only thing worse than finding an apple in your in your uh, a, a worm in your apple is finding half a worm in your apple that's right just thought i'd pass along that wisdom so to me, as I was thinking, <laughs> as I'm thinking about it, 12 fruits. So put yourself in the New Jerusalem. It's the Holy of Holies, come down out of heaven, the throne of God and the Lamb. Uh, it is layered at the bottom, remember? It has 12 layers of different kinds of stones. And I thought, ah, oh, I bet you there's a correspondence between the layers and the 12 fruits that somehow they're connected in some way, I think, to the tribes of Israel, you know, because that's where the tree comes up and goes out. So uh, I, in my thinking, I made it an enormous tree, just, just gigantic, crazy, bigger than a redwood. And the leaves, you know, go over the top of the river that flows down the middle, and then there's fruit hanging all over the place, you know. You just have to go out there and, and, and pick a piece of that. And I was like, okay, well, what, what, is this, what does this tell me about you? Because this is a revelation of God here. So I was like, Lord, what does it tell me about you? And I thought, this, this tells me that God is generous. Doesn't it tell you God's generous? I mean, this whole picture is a tremendous generosity that he should give this to us. He's generous in his love. He's generous in his care. In fact, in the Phillips books translation of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, we hear this. Now to him, that's Jesus, who by his power within us is able to do far more than we even dare to ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Can you see how perfectly the word of God begins to fit in every spot in heaven and eternity? So we in faith count on God's generosity, first in the area of his love, and then in the area of his forgiveness, and then in the area of his just providing all of our needs. Oh, and the leaves that are for healing. Did you see that? It says leaves are for the healing of the nation. Well, in my mind, where I went, <laughs> I read one commentator who said that he thinks we're going to eat the leaves. And I was like, what am I, a giraffe? Uh, I thought of the leaves. And what do you think of when you think of leaves? Tea. I thought of tea leaves. So who knows? You know, maybe we will eat them, you know. But then I, then, so there I am in, in, in the New Jerusalem. And uh, I'm picturing myself, uh, you know, there's the river of living water. And here I have this uh, bowl of mixed uh, cut up fruit. And uh, then I was, I said, like, oh, Lord, that's so cool. All I need now is a lawn chair. Uh, John doesn't mention that either. Now, Bible students in the Greek, the word used for healing is where we get our English word therapeutic. Now, that's indicating the idea of health giving rather than the thought of a need for healing. So this is a perfect environment. There's no need for healing. So as I look at this church, I just want to encourage you, you can set your hearts on this. Uh, we can set our hearts on the things above 
Heaven is our home, our real forever home. You can allow your heart to long for that. You can allow your desire and your love for God and the desire for the new Jerusalem to overweigh the pains and the trials of today. You can look at your your lovely bride or your groom and you can say to each other, it's going to be so much better, sweetheart. Let's hang on with Jesus. Let's keep going. God's brought us this far. It's going to get better. You can allow your heart to absolutely delight in this. I remember years ago, somebody was telling me about a trip that they were going to take to Belize. Anybody ever been to Belize? Anybody ever heard of Belize? <laughs> You, <laughs> you could look it up. I mean, the place is really pristine, right? I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, so they were going to take a two-week uh, trip there, uh, beautiful accommodations. Uh, and by earthly standards, it's probably, as, you know, we would call it perfect, I think, in many ways. But it's only by earthly standards because... Uh, we're, our standards are created within a fallen, decaying world where Satan is the prince of the power of the air. <laughs> so how great could it be <laughs> in comparison to what God has for us? So I'll tell you what, if you want to book me someplace, I want you to book me in the new heaven and the new earth. And I want you to put my name in the uh, register of the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen? <laughs> and uh, so let's go on. Verse uh, 3 says, And there shall be no more curse. No more curse. In fact, let's all say that together. No more curse. One, two, three. No more curse. <laughs> I would love at, at the point in this account to be able to create some kind of a freeze frame. You know, it's like if we were watching a DVD of this, the angel says to John, uh, and there shall be no more curse. And then you just were able to freeze the picture. You were able to catch the expression on the angel's face as he told that to John. You'd be able to see the expression on John's face as he heard that. And I thought to myself, I'll bet you that the expression on John's face was absolute bewildered joy. And I think that's going to be the expression on my face when we get here. It's going to be absolute bewildered joy. Verse 3 continues, But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Remember, that's our home. God wants to make his home with us. And that's not just an eternity. That's even now. In your daily decisions. And the things that you say to people, the things you text to people, the emails that you send, your reaction to things. God is entirely wanting to be a part of that in every, in every aspect of your life. And I need to tell you and remind, or do I need to tell you and remind you, that everything that God touches is good. Lord, this part of my life is broken. Come in now. Do something good in this broken part of my life. Come touch the way I talk. Come touch the way I listen. Come touch, Lord Jesus, the things that I look at, the things that I want to do, the things that I don't want to do. I need his involvement in every way. And it says, The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. This is a reality which is more real than the reality that we're experiencing right now. Namely, and mostly because the reality that you're speaking of right now and that we're living in right now is temporary. It all going to burn out, all going to fade away. It's all going to go no matter what it is. Now, this verse 3 and this verse 4, I kind of broke it down in the following way. First of all, no more curse. And what no more curse means is perfected redemption. Now you say, I've been redeemed, right? I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You have been. But this is perfected redemption as the curse is entirely gone. And how about this? The throne that's in the midst. 
There's a throne in the midst. That talks to me about God's perfect order. Now, I want God to rule and reign in my life. But I don't always bow to his lordship. Sometimes I'm a wandering little sheep. How about you? Prone to wander, prone to leave the one that we love. But in this case, the throne of God is right there with us. That's God's perfect order is restored. How about servants shall serve? That's perfect fulfillment. Perfect meaning, perfect fulfillment. There won't be anybody saying, I don't know what I want to do in my life. <laughs> I don't know what I want to be. I wish I really knew what I was meant for. <laughs> this is going to be the experience servants shall serve of perfect fulfillment, perfect meaning. How about this shall see his face? To me, that talks about perfect fellowship. Perfect fellowship with Jesus. I'll go like this. Hey, Jesus. And he'll go, yes, Paul. <laughs> face to face talks about nearness talks about would you like to see the expressions on Jesus face you will that's what this is saying how about name on foreheads his name on our foreheads that talks to me about perfect identification I belong to him I'm my beloved's and he is mine and his banner over me is love that talks about perfect identification. It talks about perfect consecration. That means I'm only now used just for his purposes and for no other purpose. And it also talks about eternal security. You think God's going to throw away something that belongs to him? <laughs> so this name on the foreheads is perfect identification, perfect consecration, and eternal security. And I really like this part where it says... His servants shall serve him. Probably the very best servants there are right now, right, are the angels. If you notice the angels, every time they show up in the scriptures, they say, God says. <laughs> they don't want any credit, right? They just come in, do what they're supposed to do, and then they're out of there. <laughs> they're not looking for credit or kudos they're like perfect servants of God. They see his face. They do his will. And this angel goes to John. The servants shall serve him. It reads as though it's matter of fact. The servants of God serve him. And that's how it is. His servants are serving. How could it be any other way? It almost seems to me like saying anybody who's in heaven is a servant of God. Sometimes that makes us question how good a servant am I right now? See, because all these things, the reflection of the glory of God, all these things that are going to be in the new heaven and the new earth, I can begin to experience them now. Why can't I be a servant of God now? I've had people say to me before, I'd love, I would, I've always loved to be in ministry. How do you get into ministry? Want me to tell you how? Real easy. I used to tell the Bible students this at the Bible college. You want to be in ministry? Because everybody in, in, in the Bible college wants to be in ministry. You want to be in ministry? They all say, yes. I'm going to tell you how to do it. You want, want me to tell you? They're like, yes, tell me how you do it. I say, find somebody who's doing something for God and help them. You're in ministry. Can I help you carry that? You're in ministry. Can I... Can I pray for you. You're in ministry. That's all that it is. The servants are serving. That's what servants do. And he just kind of like throws it out there. Like, of course, what else could there be but that? Uh, you know, in heaven, you're not going to find, in heaven, there will be no bulletins that say, we need help on overheads. We need help on hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> you're just not going to happen. Why won't it happen there? Because the servants are found serving. <laughs> are you a servant of God? That, I'm just I'm telling you how it works. Uh, nor will there be layoffs at the plant. <laughs> okay? There won't be anybody out trying to scam anybody else. 
More pointedly, there will be no work in work. Remember, the curse is gone. There'll be no work in work. So we will happily say goodbye to the curse. The service spoken of here is the coming reality of the pure blessedness in service with nothing of the arduous, curse-stained soil of work in a fallen world. I'm going to take some of us way back. Anybody here remember Dobie Gillis? Oh, look, we got some people to raise their hands. <laughs> Wasn't he the one that always was allergic to work? He couldn't even say the word. He was like, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> I have to go to woo, woo. <laughs> I remember one of the jokes my brother tells is uh, I would ask him, how's work? And he would always go, if they didn't pay me, I wouldn't go. <laughs> it's work. Work is work. But guess what? Here, work is not going to be work. The servants are going to be serving. It's going to be awesome. Uh, also, the whole idea of prayer will change. Uh, I don't know. I can't see how we would be supplicating, you know, like, oh, Lord, please do this. You got to take care of this. Lord, we really need you here, you know. I, I don't. I don't see that here. I think it's not going to be prayer like that. It's going to be prayer like, like conversation. Yeah, maybe directions. You know, where do you want me to go, Lord? How, okay, how, how should I do? I don't see the other at all here, um, which, which as something that I have thought of for years. For years, I have thought of this, that. Uh, I believe that uh, that Jesus may at some point say to me, uh, he may say to you, do you remember when you had to trust me? Remember, remember when you trusted me? Because there, he's there. There, there's no sin, there's no curse, there's no enemy. So there's something... I know you don't like trials and nobody likes living in a fallen world, but listen to me. There is something to be developed, something so special to be created between you and the Lord. And that can only happen, excuse me, in the nasty here and now. That uh, you, sometimes you'll hear soldiers talk about brothers in arms and why are they so tight? Why will they do anything for each other? Because we were in the foxhole together and I got your back and you got mine and I'll die for you. Right? That whole thing. You understand that. There's something like that that is to be formed between you and your Savior. Remember when you had to trust me. And then I hope that he follows that up with and you did. I know how hard that was for you. And you trusted me. Would you like to taste some living water? Oh, yes, Lord. Come on. Hey, does that, does that just encourage you? Did you just let that well up in you as faith and say, I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to put up a fight against sin. I want to walk in the Spirit. I don't want the enemy to take advantage of me. I want closeness with Jesus Christ. I will keep on believing. I, my God can do anything. I just need to trust Him. Learn how to walk with Him. Spurgeon wrote, It is the chief blessing of heaven the very cream of heaven, the heaven of heaven, that the saints shall there see Jesus. <laughs> that just will be remarkable. We'll go, hey, there he is. 
And for him to say, come on over. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. Verse 5, and we'll end with this. There shall be no night there. I think I already told you, I'm, I'm working through this right now, having to give up my pillow. Uh, but apparently that's going to be the case. There shall be no night there. Uh, they need no lamp, nor light of the sun, S-U-N, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's the whole idea of everything that is seen is based on a reflection bouncing off of the radiating glory of God. Uh, we've already, we covered this a little bit last week, the thought that uh, the electric company is going to go out of business. Uh, <laughs> One other one I thought of is the Energizer Bunny can finally stop his incessant drumming. Uh, <laughs> we'll be operating in resurrected, glorified bodies operating by sun, S-O-N, power. And with one final expression from John, he concludes the believer's heavenly experience. And he says, they shall reign forever and ever not just servants and not just slaves but will reign with Christ do I know what that means I do not nor do I think anybody else knows what that means and I did a lot of reading on this we will reign with Christ there's something so huge catch this there's something so huge about God's love for you that he wants you to reign with him. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be fantastic. All that was lost in the fall is redeemed by the Son of God. The picture of eternal life in these verses indicates that we will be busy serving forever, but we will both serve him and we will reign with him. The possibilities of what God can and will do must be endless because he is an eternal God with an eternal mind, however the mind of God works. I think the great thing of heaven is going to be the constant variety. It's going to be something new to learn, someplace new to go, something new to do, some way in which we will reign with him forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this word, and I thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. All this is triggered out of your love for us. For God so loved us that he gave his son. And now, Lord, I ask that you would take this word by your spirit and etch it onto our hearts. Let it be our operating system in this fallen world because there is such glory coming when we see your face. Forgive us now of our sins. Help us to indeed make you the Lord of our lives at all times. Prepare our hearts now for communion, for we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. Ushers.